This is Join Us in France, episode 26. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And we welcome you to the Join Us in France travel podcast. Elise is a professional tour guide, art historian, and a very good storyteller. Oh, but, oh boy, <laughs> am I. Well, well, well. <laughs> On today's show, we'll be talking about a city near Paris called Chartres, or Chartres. 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 Well, you sing it French, say it American. I don't know how to say it in the American. And the American, if I say chart, people say, what's that? Uh, so it's chartres. It's chartres. chartres. You yeah, you can, you, in you that have one, to do it. Yeah, you, you know? have to have the R, otherwise it just doesn't sound... Most people <laughs> who are English speaking don't hear it, but... Yeah, yeah. So we'll be talking about Chartres today. It has a world-famous cathedral, and Elise has actually mentioned it many times on different podcasts so far. <laughs> when I mean, I get to talk. That's right, to do the real thing. <laughs> when I was preparing for this podcast, I was trying to think whether I had visited, and I don't think so. But I, I, I looked at a bunch of pictures, and it doesn't ring a bell. It doesn't ring a bell. Yeah, but mm -hmm. the, the city of Chartres is lovely. You're going to tell us about that and mm -hmm. then about the cathedral. It'll be very fun. So if you're new to the show, we welcome you and hope you stick around. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you know that I've sometimes mentioned that I'd like your listeners to subscribe to both the podcast and the website. I don't think I've ever explained why I'd like you to subscribe to the website. So let me try that today. When you subscribe to the podcast, we don't know who you are and we really don't know, need to know who you are. But when you subscribe to the website, that means you're sharing your email address with us. And why would we want that, really? The only thing I use your email address for is to let you know when a new episode is ready. I've never sent more than one email a week, and I don't plan on doing that ever, really. But the reason why I would like you to subscribe to the website is because once in a while, there are things that happen that I'd like to be able to tell you. An email is quick. Mm -hmm. It's quick, it's cheap. It, it always works. I mean, you know, there are a lot of technical difficulties that are possible with a podcast, but email always works. So, for instance, um, we don't record the episodes on the week, in the week that we release them. You've probably caught on to that by now, but, you know, we can't because just like most podcasters, we have a regular release schedule for the podcast But the recording schedule is different because we both work and we don't have time. This summer, for instance, Elise and I are not going to see each other very, well, probably not at all. Not at all. Because she's going to be in Paris. <laughs> Start crying, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, she's going to be in Paris doing uh, tour guide things and I'm going to be doing my own thing, a vacation and, you know, I mean... That's just normal. And so we've had to record a whole bunch of episodes ahead of time. For instance, today is July 4th. Happy July 4th. Happy July 4th, That's, everybody. It's not a holiday in France. We're working. Not at all. <laughs> But uh, so this episode is not going to be released until I think it's July 26th when this one comes out. So what happens in the meantime if there's something really exciting that I need to tell you about Chartres? I have no way to tell you. No way. If I don't put it in today, I'm done. The, the episode is in the can. I can't edit it after all. So that's one of the reasons why. Also, this in August, we are probably going to skip one week. Uh, we, we're not going to release an episode on the 30th. But you see, it would be really nice for me on that day to be able to send an email saying, remember this week, no No podcast, we'll be back next week or something like that. Okay, so that's why we would really like you to subscribe to the website. And how do you do that? You go to joinusinfrance.com and on the top left-hand side, you'll see there's an input box and a green button. You write your email address in the box, push on the green button and you're done. And you're done done that's it do it please do it it will really make my life easier and that way you know sometimes it's a little stressful i get up on a saturday morning i prepare the episode i put it up um, online so that you can find it in itunes and other podcatchers and sometimes it doesn't go very well i have to say sometimes i have technical difficulties and i always think oh crap what if it doesn't work this time i always get it to work eventually but what if it doesn't i have no way of telling people so 
please subscribe to the website. Thank you. Done. Done. Now we'll have a little music to get us in the mood and we'll come back and talk about it. <laughs> All right, Elise, we're back. Well, you ready? Yes, I am. Excellent. I'm all ears because I really need to go visit. It's a shame I haven't yet. Uh, shame, shame. Shame on you. Shame yeah. on everybody else, <laughs> too. Uh, uh, to me, <clears throat> well, there are two things. Number one, as you mentioned, uh, Chartres is actually a town but it's famous for its cathedral. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the town and its history, and then we'll talk about the cathedral, of course. It's a perfect day trip out of Paris. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes I know that uh, people have actually done it in even less than a day. Really? Uh, it's one hour by train. Oh, that's pretty quick. You go to Chartres from Paris by the Montparnasse train station, uh -huh. which is in the southwest of, of Paris. Mm -hmm. Because Chartres is southwest of Paris, it is 90 kilometers, okay. which is about 60, 65 miles. Yep. You can get there by car, too. Sure. Uh, it's the same. It's just about an hour's drive. I mean, notwithstanding getting out of Paris if you have a car. And, and, and yeah, that idea. might make it longer for you. But if you, are, um, if you have a car and you are uh, interested in driving around, it's not the most gorgeous road that takes you from Paris to Chartres because it goes through an area, and this is part of the history of the city, but we're entering into an area that is directly southwest of Paris called the Beauce. La Beauce. La Beauce. La Beauce. Yeah. Uh, B E A U C E. Yep. And the Beauce is the breadbasket of France. Mm -hmm. It's the it's one of the flattest regions of uh, the country. Mm. And it's uh, uh, my husband makes fun of me because I have a tendency to not like things that are flat very much. <laughs> and well, most so people I think prefer a little hilly. They uh, like hilly and you know mountains and people, everything. Anyway. But the Beauce can have a certain charm to it because it is endless, endless amounts of beautiful wheat fields, mm -hmm. and uh, there are little villages and very old villages uh, running through it. Mm. And uh, the city of Chartres uh, is uh, one of them. It's actually a small city. You can say that, I guess, in American terms, we'd say it's a town. It's about 40,000 people. Okay. And it used to be smaller. But in fact, since World War II, uh, because of the extension of roads and the use of cars and because it has developed uh, a, certain f a certain cachet as a place to be, there are more and more people who have gone to live in Chartres and in the region right around it. And there are some people who actually do commute from Chartres Well, yeah, because Paris. if it's just one hour, you know, the right. if you work close to the train station, if you, you work can. close to Montmartre, it's not so bad, It's really. not so bad, yeah. right? And, of course, we know that there are people who live in the regular suburbs of Paris who do more than an hour commute anyway. Of course. And they're not in anything nearly as beautiful or prestigious as a town like <laughs> Chartres. Right. right. <laughs> so Chartres is, in fact, as you can... Uh, tell by what we've been talking about. It is, first of all, a town. And it is a town that has uh, been well-known in the old history of the Kingdom of France for a very, very long time. And its cathedral is very famous. It is a world UNESCO heritage site. It is one of the first to have been named that way in France. Well, yeah, that which makes is very sense. interesting. And uh, if you've heard of it at all, You've heard of it because of its stained glass windows, mm -hmm. but it's also famous for some other things. So we'll talk about the details of the cathedral in a few minutes because it is absolutely magnificent. It mm. is. Uh, we've talked a lot about Notre Dame in Paris, which of course is world famous. Chat is also world famous. And because of the uh, windows in it, uh, we talk about the blue of Chartres, mm -hmm. the blue which is a glass blue, uh, and we'll talk. I'll talk a little bit about how that was actually made in, in a few minutes. So uh, imagine we are about <clears throat> 60, 65 miles south, southwest of Paris, and as far back as the Roman times, this was an important city. There are actually some Roman ruins still in the old part of Chartres, which is a lovely, lovely small town, very easy to walk around the old uh, city center. And uh, the ruins uh, show that the city goes back actually 
uh, to just about 2,000 years ago. Mm. <clears throat> and apparently, uh, something I didn't know, but it is kind of interesting because it's related to the development of the cathedral, it was one of the first areas to be officially Christianized. Oh. So we're talking, you know, the, <clears throat> the fall of the Roman Empire started basically at the end of the 200s, 300s AD, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, little by little, you know, with all these invasions and um, the period that we talk about always with all these crazy invasions of these different groups coming in, uh, most of what is now France was Christianized little by little. Mm -hmm. And uh, this area was apparently... Uh, there are documents that indicate that it was Christianized quite, quite early. So maybe perhaps even by the year 150, 200, which is really, really very, very early yeah. for basically Western Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. M most of France was much later Most of France that. was about 350, yeah. really, yeah, really from that about. Yeah, a big difference. So it's about 150 years earlier. Yeah. And uh, because of that, it it had not only a few churches from the beginning, but it also had monks and some monasteries mm. and i i'm not sure exactly what uh particular kind you know in france there are many different orders of monks and and back then who <coughs> knows what and who orders, knows what they mm, were yeah uh, because we do know uh, when the orders that are well established started and that was a bit later than that but there is documentation that indicates that this was very early on a very christianized area and the first writings actually about the area start from about the year 450, which is very interesting because that's really about the official end of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And this is when we have the beginning of the massive invasion of different groups that are uh, going to come and stay for a while. And that includes, of course, the first wave of this group of peoples called the Franks. Mm -hmm. And they are, of course, the people who eventually gave their nom name to the country, right. France. Um, but I bet a lot of people didn't know. I knew this, but I had to go back and do some reading about it. The Vikings came through this area, too. And the Vikings came through this area, actually, in the very, very beginning of the 800s. Mm. So there were already uh, established monasteries. There were already established, a, it was a Christian church. There were already a kind of nobility in the area that were connected to the Frankish kingdom. But what happened was uh, the Normans who were the Vikings, um, they eventually became the Normans, which means the Northmen, the people from the north, right. who took over the area of what is now Normandy, uh, they came up the different rivers. You know, they came up the Seine River. They, they were, of course, a seafaring people, and uh, they raided wherever they went, and they came and they burned Jacques to the ground. Oh, Completely. Not friendly. Not friendly. <laughs> not friendly at all. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what you get out of burning a place to the ground, but that is exactly you what they did. The, mm, I don't know. You know, well, it says that they, it was burned. They sacked the city, which was also part of what they basically did as an occupation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, everything was literally burned to the ground. So what happened was that uh, with, with money from uh, the different monasteries and from the man who was actually the grandson of Charlemagne. So now we're entering into the kingdom of the uh, Franks who wind up creating what we now call France mm -hmm. in the year 876, official documented, uh, with help from uh, the grandson of Charlemagne, a man who was the king eventually of this area called Charles the Bald. Yeah. And with help from the Benedictine monasteries who were the main order of all through this time, starting in the back the 700s, going up through another four or 500 years, with money from both of these, they started to rebuild the city. They built ramparts around the city. And they this started is sounding familiar. Is they this sounding familiar? Did this <coughs> other places too. Oh, well, <laughs> they, everything had ramparts around it at some point or another. Yeah. And, and they rebuilt uh, a big, big, church now this is not the one that we're going to talk about in a few well, minutes clearly, yeah. because unfortunately about 200 years later not due to being invaded and uh, destroyed by uh, another group like the vikings but because of a fire and this of course was one of the biggest dangers in the middle ages everywhere in every yeah. city every major city paris toulouse every city we know of and talk about had a period where there were major fires because uh, there were no such things as, as safety rules, and people used oil, and there was everything was made of wood and hay, and mm -hmm. uh, fires propagated very, very easily. Yeah. Uh, so the city was first rebuilt in 876, and by virtue of having 
a relic that is considered to be authentic, and that is the veil that the Virgin Mary wore. Mm. And now, this is what, uh, they, it was brought back by a crusade mm -hmm. from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And because the new church, starting in the 900s, acquired this veil, mm -hmm. it became an important stop on a pilgrimage trail. Okay. And uh, we've talked a little bit in, I think, in other podcasts about the fact that there were pilgrimages uh, in a lot of places in the Middle Ages. One of the most famous ones is down in the Southwest, which is to go to San Jacques de Compostelle. But in fact, uh, there were many, many different pilgrimages. And one of them was to go from Paris to Chartres. Okay. And one of the reasons... That sounds more doable to me. It sounds a lot more doable. <laughs> even you and I could probably do it, even, yeah. even today. I mean, yeah. aside from the fumes from the cars going there, <laughs> back and forth. Uh, but unfortunately, in the year 9-11, the Vikings attacked again. Mm. And uh, the story is, and I like stories like this. You'll have to excuse me. It's not so much cynicism as it is, I think, that there's a certain quality of fairy tale about it, but I think it's absolutely wonderful. The Vikings, they, they were, the, the city had been warned that the Vikings were coming again. And this time, because they had the veil of the Virgin Mary, the bishop came out in the street and uh, stood in front of the cathedral and basically held up the veil of the Virgin Mary and at some point, I'm not sure exactly where, and I'm not sure exactly <laughs> how, but it stopped the Vikings. It stopped the Vikings. It stopped the Vikings. The veil stopped the Vikings. That's right. Well, listen, if it's good for that, It worked. You know. Wh whatever, <laughs> you know, I mean, really. So they did not get in as far as the old city center. And what happened was the fame of the city became even greater, mm -hmm. and so it had more and more pilgrims. And in fact, Shah seriously, was from the very, very beginning a very rich city for the simple reason that it was the center of the trade of wheat. Ah, well, And, so and it really even was, then even had, then, right? Wheat. Yeah, the, okay. the wheat was very, very important, and it was a very rich city. And then it became a rich city because of people coming as pilgrims. And I don't know if people know this, because maybe one day we should do a podcast just about it, but cities make a lot of money off of pilgrims, because uh, <laughs> just like now with... Uh, um, a coupe de monde, you know. I mean, when you bring a lot of people into a city, they That's have to World have places. Cup, by the way, World Cup. Uh, yeah. people, people have to have places to sleep. Of course. They buy food. Of course. They buy souvenirs. Even back in the 900s, they bought souvenirs to take back from the pilgrimages. I bet some of them were interested in a piece of that veil. I'm sure they were, but apparently <laughs> they didn't get a hold of it. It <laughs> stayed in the church for a very long time. Good, good. So, in fact, Chartres was a very, very, very prosperous city for as far back as we know about it, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, what happened was... Uh, in the midst of this time, basically in the 10th century, and this is something that I knew about, but I didn't realize its, it's connection to the history of Chartres in that way, uh, there was a bishop who was a philosopher and a theologian, and he created what has come down in the history of France and in the history even of art, which is, of course, where I, I am interested mostly. Uh, he created what is called the School of Chartres, mm. And it was a philosophical academy. And it was so famous because he used the teachings and the writings of Plato, and uh, they incorporated the ideas of the ancients into the Christian thinking. Oh. And it became the most modern, to use a word that maybe people don't really know a lot about, but it was a very dialectical school. That is, it was very Socratic. There were the questioning and answering, and it became so famous for over 200 years that philosophers and theologians came from all over the world to go to it. Wow. And it has come down in history known as the School of Chartres. Okay, and, and does it, it still exist? Well, it exists in a different form. Mm. I, I'm not even sure. I tried to f see if it existed actually still mm -hmm. as an official academy, but it is still... It exists in some form still. Okay. Uh, it, it, there's the school of the Louvre. There's a the school of Chartres. There's a the school of Versailles. It's very interesting because some of them have to do with philosophy. Some of them have to do with theology. Some of them have to do with art. But this is really a heritage that creates a very, very complex cultural background in France. And so 
all of this between Mary, the Virgin Mary's veil, mm-hmm. uh, the pilgrimages, the fact that it was the center of trade for wheat, and the creation of the school of Chartres, Chartres became very rich. Mm-hmm. And then... Virgin Mary veils, good for business. Good for business. Most of this is actually very, sorry, very good for business. Be She's being a little cynical. bit more cynical <laughs> than I am. It's, we'll just have to live with that. Well, you know? because I wonder, you know, how... How did they know that it was her veil? Well, you know, nowadays we do um, carbon dating on some of these things. Carbon dating, DNA. Right. We can do some DNA. But, you know, I- in the Middle Ages, in the cases of a lot of these... Uh, relics? Relics, thank you. I was going to think of it. I was trying to think of a different word, but relics is fine. Um, because relics I associate with actually pieces of a body. Mm. But in this case, it's like the... Um, it's like what the the piece of the shroud that's in Turin, you know, in Turin in, in, yeah. in Italy. Um, those uh, cloth can be dated, uh, basically, because it's it's got uh, vegetal fiber in it. Uh, I don't know what they would say about it now, but what it is tr- what is true is that very often these were things that were brought back from Jerusalem, and they were in the uh, Christian uh, castles and the fortified castles and the churches in Jerusalem forever and ever, Mm. really. Mm. Basically what we could say from the beginning, so that uh, when St. Louis brought back the crown of thorns to put in the Saint-Chapelle, and we did our Saint-Chapelle, and that is, of course, the reason he actually had it built. He built the the church. Yeah, that was episode number three. To house the crown of thorns. Um, I don't know if there's any way to prove that it was what Christ wore, But because it is wood, it can be dated to that time, you see. Right. So what they know, in fact, is that they have something very old. Very old. That got preserved. That got preserved. So you can assume that if they preserve, if they took the the effort to preserve it for posterity, they wouldn't have done that if it was any old. Right. You know, Uh, know, maybe that's how they think about it. I I think so. And I think that it could have been her. It could have been someone else. If it's contemporary to a certain time period, that's as good as we're going to get. I yeah. mean, I don't. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the fact is, uh, if you have a body, even that dates back that far, and we're getting off a little bit of the subject of, of shock, but <laughs> in terms of talking about relics, which is very important in a lot of the churches anyway, in both France and in Italy, um, if you have a body, you can actually verify DNA. But when you have no body and you have a piece of cloth, all you can do is verify the age of the cloth. Right. And that's, that's that. Well, and and even it goes with, by faith and after even that. Even with DNA, you have to have f- like a compar- something to compare it with. Right. You right. Know, otherwise, it's worthless. So. so what we do know is that whatever uh, this piece of cloth was... They thought it was really It valuable. really was yeah. for them uh, the veil... And Mm -hmm. it was considered to be one of the greatest treasures in uh, Christian France. Mm -hmm. Uh, Don't forget that this is uh, actually earlier than the crown of thorns that was brought back from from Jerusalem by Saint Louis. Uh, This is in the 900s. This is is already, they had it in the 800s. So this is way before, you know, Mm -hmm. this is quite a bit before. Mm. So what happens is that Chartres is this absolutely fabulous uh, town. And it is uh, a very distinguished town. And then what happens is in the year 1194, the church that had been built, which was a Romanesque cathedral. Mm -hmm. Now, Romanesque is the earliest of these styles, and we don't really know very much what it looked like, but the church was burned down. Mm. Now, it was probably an accidental fire, but it's hard sometimes for people to realize that even though the outside is made of a lot of stone, the inside is almost all carpentry work. Yeah, And what happens is that the fire um, burned so badly that almost all of the church was destroyed, but not quite. So Mm. this is what makes it so interesting, that of the entire enormous church, the west side, the west portals, Mm -hmm. and part of one of the western towers did not burn. Oh. Everything else burned. So uh, the... uh, They attempted to start the rebuilding of the church immediately. Mm. As I mentioned, they were very wealthy. They received money, obviously, from the king of France. They received money probably also from Rome. And uh, it was decided that since Chartres 
was such an important city, and it was so important in terms of being a Christian town and also being a rich city, that they literally, as soon as the embers were cooled, they cleared it away and they began the rebuilding of the cathedral. And one of the things that is utterly remarkable about this, and this is why, not, not just its beauty, and it's, it's absolutely breathtaking, but when you go there and you see what this is, it was built entirely in 30 years. Wow. Every other cathedral in France has taken 100 to 150 and sometimes almost 200 years because mm -hmm. of lack of money, because of various wars, because of one thing and another. This church is documented and one of the few to be documented where we actually know the names of the, mem the people who not designed it, but who were responsible for the actual building of the mm. church and mm. even the names of some of the guild people who worked on the sculpture and some of the windows and everything else. So it is unique in the history of all of these major cathedrals because of the time that it took yeah. to be built. And, and how, how did the, the relic, the veil relic, relic, how did it not get burned? This is the miracle of things. Okay, okay. Okay. All right. We, we just... It didn't get burned, though. It did not get burned. Okay. It did not get burned. Now I feel better. You feel better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> really, it, it, you know, um, we'll talk about things that get destroyed and, 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 and get preserved in, in a couple of minutes because it has to do also, again, with what happened in the cathedral in World War II. But strangely enough, um, do people know ahead of time? Did they take it out and hide it somewhere? Why do things get saved and others don't? It's a strange yeah. mystery yeah. In, in many cases. So, but what 30 years is really impressive. 30, 30, 30 years, years is, is really unheard of. Short. It's actually unheard of. Yeah. Uh, they, they, what they did was they gathered together all of the guilds that existed, which means the stonemasons, the carpenters, the roofers, the people who made glass, the people who did the flooring, every imaginable guild, which is, of course, how workers worked in, in corporations uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, the money uh, was there. There was no question about running out of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did not stop. It was nonstop for 30 years. And what happened was... They built the church, and this is where we get these wonderful uh, things because it is actually true, but, you know, I mean, there's always legend that winds up being attached to it. The church that burned down, which was considered a th cathedral already, which, of course, is where a bishop or an archbishop has his, his uh, headquarters, uh, it was originally built over a site that had a well, a well, a uh, water okay. well, yeah. that was uh, dug into the ground because the region... Chart, the town, is actually up on a hill. Okay. The rest of the area in the Beauce is quite flat, but uh, one of the things that's wonderful is when you come into Chartres, uh, whether you come in by train or come in by car, you go through the modern outer areas, which is now suburban and shopping center and all that, mm -hmm. and then you get to the old city, and it's actually all built up on a hill, and it leads your eye up to the cathedral, which is dead center, and just rises up out of it. Well, it turns that's out really nice. that underneath... Uh, there was a well that was dug into a grotto, uh, an open an open cave, um, mm -hmm. that was used by the Druids. <laughs> uh, the Druids, who of course were the uh, the priests of the Celts, right. who lived there before the Romans arrived. And it, this is one of the few places in France where the Druid ceremonies were actually documented there. Mm. And so when they started building a church there, they built it over this well that's in this grotto, and the first Romanesque cathedral was built on top of this space. Mm. And that, when it burned down, they rebuilt again on top of this space. And to this day, when you go to the cathedral of Chartres, when you go to the uh, center, and in most of these cathedrals, like in Notre Dame in Paris, there's a crypt. Sure. And the crypt is where most of the relics were kept of the different saints for pilgrims. The yep. crypt is actually right on top of this well that was <laughs> used by the Druids. And it has been verified that is really, the well is really underneath there. And it wow. is the most ancient part of the cave. But you can't visit it. You can actually see it. Yes, you can. You can see it? You can see the, the, the well. I don't know if you can get up close to it anymore, but you uh. can actually see it. There's an archway and you can actually see it That's from a distance. Cool. It's really cool, right? So what happens is they rebuild this church 
And it's now, of course, we're entering into the 1200s and we are in northern France. So we are entering into the first phase of Gothic architecture. Mm -hmm. And everybody uh, works on this church, making it the most magnificent church imaginable. And it imagined from 1194, that takes us to what, 1224? Okay. And by 1224, the structure was finished. Mm. Then they bring in all of these different corporations to do the decoration on the inside and the sculpture on the outside. And we still have the Western Wall, which has three enormous portals, which is very unusual. It's a church that has uh, quite a few entrances into it. And instead of having just two, it has three, which, of course, is followed afterwards by Notre Dame in y- Paris. Yes, a lot of uh, large cathedrals yeah. do that in France. And Strasbourg they, is like that. Strasbourg is, is like that. Which came out, all of these, of course, modeled basically after this. Yeah. And, and, and for whatever reason that this Western Wall was saved, the whole facade, what was also saved was the three huge Gothic Bay windows above the doorways. Mm. And... Uh, the crypt was not burned and the veil was not burned either. So they rebuilt around all of this. That Mm. is, they rebuilt using the Western Wall. So when you go there to this day, the Western Wall and the Western Towers are from the church that is actually end of Romanesque and beginning of Gothic and dates to the 1100s. Mm. The rest of it dates to the beginning of the 1200s. And so they rebuilt it and they made it very, very high. And they brought in the most important stone sculptors, and they asked for glass windows to be brought in. Now, this is before Saint-Chapelle, and this is before the finishing of Notre Dame. But the church that that came before this one, that inspired the stained glass windows in the cathedral, was the church at Saint-Denis. Hmm. And Saint-Denis is a, is a town, actually, uh, that was at that point a little bit far. Now it's just butts up to the, the actual city center of Paris. Yes. But Saint-Denis is where uh, the cardinal that was the cardinal for the king had his church and his monastery and cathedral. And that church was the very first church to use magnificent tall stained glass windows. So when they decided to rebuild Chartres, they got the workers from Saint-Denis to come down to Chartres. Hmm. Now, what happened there as an artist and an art historian? This is one of those things that I would love to know about. What happened was that the minerals that they used for making the blue in these stained glass windows in Chartres was even more intense and deep as a color than the blue that had been used in Saint-Denis, which is why you get the same one actually later on in, in the Saint-Chapelle in, in Paris. Mm-hmm. And it was a mixture of, uh, it's a sodium carbonate mixed with cobalt. Okay. And it's ground together. And uh, you know, the secret of this glass is... Isn't cobalt radioactive? Cobalt is, I have no idea. It's not... Um, I think as a mineral, it's just ground down. I don't believe it's radioactive. I have okay. to say, but what happened was that when they finished these windows, uh, the the church immediately became famous everywhere. Not only for the amount of sculpture and the beauty of the sculpture inside and out, but the colors, but the colors in these windows. And to this day, from the twelve forties till now. We talk about Chartres Blue. Right. And it is a blue, if you like blue, uh, it is unbelievable as Mm -hmm. a dense, saturated color. And it has a slight, 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 slight purplish tinge. I mean, that's cobalt blue. I mean, it's it's that kind of color. It's a bit of a warm blue. It's a very warm blue. And of all the colors in all the windows in the cathedral, a little bit of the reds have turned color a little bit of the yellows and the greens the blues have never never turned color Mm -hmm. what has happened to them and which is what they have worked on in in the end of the 20th century and uh working still now is they've been cleaning them up Mm -hmm. because since uh 800 years have passed 
what has happened is that they've picked up a lot of soot and pollution from the outside. Oh, sure. And so there, I have been to Chartres. Uh, the last time I was there was a few, couple of years ago, maybe two or three years ago. But I've been there in, in my years of living and visiting France. I've been there probably four or five times. And uh, there was a period when half the windows were not visible anymore because they were so dirty. They wind mm. up looking black because you get the light coming in from the outside. Right. And then you have to do something. And now, even if you go on internet, you can see that little by little, they have been cleaning up the windows. Right. And they we, are making them beautiful again. That's something that we're very lucky because we live in France. And so we can just pop into these churches every now and then and see them on a sunny day. I mean, even if on the day we happen to visit, it's not sunny and glorious... Maybe we'll go again and get, bet, you know be luckier. Whereas if you're just visiting, well, that's that's your one chance. That's your to, one chance. You know, if you, you know. if you get the sun, that's great. But if not, th that's why there's photography. That's why there's photography. <laughs> so the church was actually the stained glass windows were completed by the year 1240, uh -huh. and the church was consecrated in its ultimate, absolute, finished form with everything, every piece of interior decoration, sculpture, and uh, everything else uh, in 1260. Wow. But the actual structure of the church took only 30 years. The church is 130 meters long. It's mm. very long. Mm -hmm. It's very big. One of the unique things about it, not one of the most beautiful things about it, but one of the things that if you have a series of photos of different cathedrals in France... The way you know the one that's shot, if you can't identify anything else, is it's one of the only ones that has towers that are different. Hmm. The two towers are different. <laughs> Why? Because one of the towers is prior to 1194, mm -hmm. and the other tower is after. Okay. And so one is actually higher than the other. See, that's, that's a handy-dandy thing to know. Like, if you want to impress your friends... <laughs> They, they show them their, your, their vacation picture. Your vacation pictures, and, and right. And then, you, oh, they're on Chartres. Why did you know that? How did you know that? <laughs> well, like, because it, I'm very smart. Because you're very smart. <laughs> you're very, very smart. So it, it is, uh, I'm just going to give some statistics because it's a, it, this is really quite amazing. Um, there are 2,600 square meters of stained glass in this church. Mm -hmm. That's now, a lot of stained glass. That's a lot. That is an awful lot of stained glass yeah because uh, your regular regular house window is probably what a square what, meter a square a meter meter and a half yeah and so that would be if it was in a house it'd be how many meters did 2600 you? Oh, square geez. meters oh jeez there's probably not that many windows in my whole village it has 176 <laughs> 176 uh the double tall gothic windows now these are you know immensely tall and they're doubled you know so that there's a there's a a, a stone uh, structure in between but they this is what we call the gothic window which is very thin relatively narrow mm -hmm. relatively narrow we're talking about in a space that's enormous anyway it rises up um i don't even actually have the statistic but it rises up uh, i don't know how many meters high and of course inside that you have uh, framed in um, in lead, you have sections by medallion, and inside each section you have probably about a thousand pieces of glass. Oh wow! So this is this is the kind of statistics you, you just okay. cannot imagine. Now, one of the wonders of uh, Chartres uh, is that you can see a lot of the windows, and it's famous because having had all of these guilds work on the windows many of the guilds actually paid the money for one of the windows themselves. And it's oh. famous. So there are lovely, wonderful pictures because besides having kings and queens and all of these other people who donated money for a building of a window, on the bottom of windows... Now, one of the things I think I mentioned with Saint-Chapelle, but I, it's, there's no harm in, in re-mentioning it. You read windows, and you read them from the bottom up, from left to right. So if you have a double window... You will read from the bottom left across to the section on the right because it's double. And then you go back to the left and you work your way up again. And we, we read from left to right. So this mm -hmm. is the, the bottom sections of almost all the windows in Chartres will show you the group of people who paid for the window. Mm. So one window is paid for by the bakers. One window is paid for by the carpenters. And you see them doing their activity. 
-hmm. And it's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. And the windows are absolutely magical. Now, personally, I know that Saint-Chapelle is a wonder to see because Mm -hmm. it is basically a small church that is almost not wall. It's almost all glass. Yeah. But I l- prefer Chartres. Ah, you do. I really do. And one of the reasons why is because, first of all, you are in this immensity of a cathedral that has the most gorgeous and most enormous and beautiful series of sculptures everywhere, mm-hmm. inside and out. You have 3,500 statues oh, on wow. the walls inside, outside the building, you have these windows that just take you to another universe Mm -hmm. because they are so immense and so saturated with this magnificent, magnificent blue. And something that's very special and is also one of the things that is really uh, one of the things that makes it wonderful to go to Chaffre, it is a cathedral that has a huge labyrinth on the floor Oh. Now, in the Renaissance, in the time of the Renaissance, it became very fashionable again to use the symbol of the labyrinth as a way of talking about the cycle of life. But in fact, this is a cathedral from the 1200s, and it is the first place that ever used the labyrinth from the early Christian times. And it is a huge one in the dalage on the floor that is in the stone on the floor. And uh, what they do now, and what they've been doing for about... You said the word dalage. Dalage, yes. Dalage. Dalage, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a French word. Is it's it a French an English word. word? Yeah, no, it's a French word. Oh, probably. she made that up. I made that up. She, she means... <clears throat> uh, uh, the, stone, the stone floor. Uh, yeah. The stone flooring. It's yeah. not tile. It's actually stone. Yeah. But what they did was, the original workers, they put in this labyrinth that is based on the labyrinth of the Minotaur. Uh, this is a whole very oh. mythological thing. It's very, very complex. It's very esoteric. Uh, It's very big, uh, and what uh, they've been doing now for the last 25, 30 years is that every Friday, one day a week, I don't know exactly why they chose it that way, but that's what they do, one day a week on Friday, they push back to the sides of the nave all the chairs in the center, it's in the central part of the church, it doesn't cover the entire floor of the Uh church, uh, because it's basically in a square anyway, but it's between the the second and third archways in the whole center of the nave. And they push back all the chairs, and you can walk the labyrinth. And, uh, of course, in the Middle Ages, it was considered to be a mystical thing to do because it was the idea of the cycle of the universe, so that you get to the end and you start working your way out again, Mm -hmm. and it's a cycle of rebirth and resurrection. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in the Renaissance, it became very fashionable, and they used the labyrinth in the Cathedral of Chartres as, a, as an inspiration to do labyrinths in, in many, many other places. But this is the biggest one. And uh, it's very, very, very famous. So among the other things to do That's when cool. you go there is to see this. Now, I just want to mention something because it's really an incredible thing. The process of working on these windows, which are really, really, uh, uh, they're, they're majestic. I, I, I can't think of any other word to describe mm-hmm. them. To this day, they're still working on cleaning up the windows. They do one or two a year. Mm -hmm. It costs 160,000 euros per window. 460,000? 160,000. 160,000 euros per window to clean them. To clean them. Now, cleaning is a very delicate process because you have to be very careful. These These are the oldest windows, which means... Everything is in tiny little pieces of glass. So what do they do? Do they send people up there? They take them out frame Uh, by frame. uh. In other words, a window, a Gothic window like this, you will have stone framing, and inside the stone framing, you have metallic framing, which is usually some form of iron. Mm -hmm. And then each section is barred. There's a section usually with a horizontal line that's some kind of metallic line, and that is basically a section in the window. It's usually, I would guess it about, um, I, I, I wouldn't be able to guess exactly accurately about size, but I would say it's probably about 80 centimeters by 60 centimeters each section or something like that. Okay, okay. And inside that section, you have anywhere from a few hundred to almost a thousand tiny pieces of colored glass 
Every single piece, piece of glass has a lead strip around it, holding it together with the other piece of glass. So they don't redo all of that. They clean them. So they just, why don't they clean them in situ? You like, can't. Oh. Because you have to, because some of them are fragile, and they lay them down on a table that's protected, oh. and they, very, they do this with Q-tips and things like this. I mean, it's the kind of work that okay. they do to clean these is unbelievable. And every once in a while, and this, of course, happens, you have a little piece that breaks out. Now it can either be fixed or it's replaced. It happens also that in the town of Chartres, because of the cathedral, it is one of the places in France that has the largest collection of people who still do stained glass. Sure. So they have uh, craftspeople. Now yeah. we would say not guilds people, but craftspeople who are famous and who work there. And I met one once uh, in one of my visits, and um, he said that he makes his living mostly by selling small pieces to the general public to tourists but the he's a compagnon which means he's a member of the equivalent today of a guild and the reason he was in shock was because he was allowed to work on the windows but he said he does that for the the pride and the prestige but that is not really how he makes his money because even though it costs a lot to do that the actual workers don't make that much money because it's government work and it's paid for by the minister of culture and they usually get paid well after the work is done but he said that he would never change what he does in a mm -hmm, million years mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because what they get to do is work on the windows if anything needs replacing they're the ones that take care of the replacing it and it happens that in Chartres the sculpture and the stained glass and the structure of all the major gothic cathedrals in France this is the one that has more of its original structure than any of the others, hmm. both in the glass, in the sculpture, and in the windows. Now, one final thing, because obviously, as you can tell, I want people to go to shop and well, see this. sure, sure. What happened during World War I and World War II? Yes, that's a good question. Good question, right? Hmm. We know that in a lot of the other cathedrals, the windows were destroyed. In some of the cathedrals in World War II, they were able to save a lot of the windows, mm -hmm. but not the majority of them in most of the places. In Chartres, when they discovered that there was going to be aerial bombing, they didn't do this once, they did this twice. Now, this is what makes things like this. You'd say it's not possible, but in fact, it is true. Starting in World War I, now we're only 60-something miles south of Paris, because they were afraid that the Germans were going to start flying over and bombing. And this is the beginning, of, of course, of, of uh, aerial fighting in, in war. They took down all, and I mean all, of those stained glass windows oh, wow. and protected them. What a job. And they did the same thing again in World War II. Mm. There were no windows in the cathedral when the Germans arrived. They were mm. empty, and I don't know where they were hidden, mm -hmm. but they were all hidden away somewhere, and they were all brought back as soon as the armistice Just was signed. Just putting it back together, what a puzzle. Like, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. The, the crypt I, is one of the biggest in France. <coughs> the crypt alone is mm -hmm. one of the biggest in France. Is it worth visiting? Yeah. Yeah, that one is. Everything Everything in Chartres is worth visiting. Yeah. Everything. It, it is... Uh, the, the sculpture on the outside is magnificent. Mm -hmm. The sculpture on the inside is too, although it depends on how dark it is because being that the cathedral is very high and very big, if you go in, as you mentioned, if you go in on a day that it's very somber outside, it's not that easy to see a lot right. of the things on the inside. It just isn't. That's the problem with all the major cathedrals is it's not well lit. And so unless you have really good camera equipment that will capture every photon that's available, right. you actually see things better with the pictures than you do with your own eyes. Right. When I, it's dark. If it's a, when if it's it's a bright day, that's not the same. But, but it, it really is amazing. And so uh, it, it, the, the, the luminosity... 
that comes out of this this blue is absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a man, and I, I am sorry to say that I don't remember his name because uh, he is actually fairly well known. My first trip to uh, Chartres was a very long time ago. It was uh, I was still actually a student it, when it was my first trip to France, and I went there. And um, there was an Englishman at the time. Now, I, this was a long time ago, so he was also quite a bit younger. And he was walking around, and he was describing the various scenes in the windows. And I remember tagging along behind uh, and having him describe various things. And it was probably what set me to loving uh, stained glass windows mm -hmm. and medieval uh, structure in general. And I went back to the States and I went and continued my studies because I hadn't finished them yet. And I found out later that this man who had originally shown up in Chartres just as a guy who was a tourist, he had fallen in love with the cathedral and had decided to make his life's work the cathedral and talking about it. And as far as I know, as of the last time I was there, which was about three years ago, he's probably in his 70s now. He was still doing that. Mm -hmm. And he's actually written a small book on the windows. And even though he had no formal study or training, he became he loves the, the expert on it. And yeah. people would pay. I mean, this is, I don't know if it worked that way afterwards, but when I was there, he basically said, if you want to leave me some money, you know, I mean, I was a broke student. I don't know what I left him. But, uh, <laughs> But he excuses, would, excuses, 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 excuses. <laughs> I mean, he was just saying, you know, I want to do this because I love this. And then mm -hmm. he made it into his life's career. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's easy to understand why. Yeah. So when you go there, there isn't just the cathedral, though. There is this lovely little town with beautiful half timbered medieval houses. Mm -hmm. It's very charming. There are a couple so of small canals that run around the, the bottom of the hill. Is it just the cathedral that's a UNESCO World Heritage, or is it the whole town, the it's whole the, city? It's the, the cathedral and the old city center right okay. around it. Okay, okay. And, and it's very, very lovely. And it's a lovely, lovely place, you know, and you can have a lunch there, or you can have a drink and sit and look at the cathedral. And, and one of the other things that I found so wonderful was that they have stores where you have these stained glass uh, window makers that, that work and you can see their work. You have people who do stone sculpture and there's a whole lot of craftspeople who have set up shop in the area around it. Uh, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's really lovely. So this is uh, just an absolutely fabulous place to go and you can get there very easily from Paris. Yeah, that's really interesting that you can just get on the train and how, how long do you think, I mean, the day trip is enough oh, to see uh, Chartres oh, it, and the You cathedral. don't even have, you know, some people would spend a whole day. I, I know that there are people who don't even spend the whole day. The train hmm. ride is, I think, 50, 55 minutes. Okay. And uh, if you get there and you visit the town, and you visit the cathedral, and if you do it really, I mean, you really visit it, you, that is, you, you don't walk in and out, but you actually take mm -hmm. the time to read up about the different sculpture because it's absolutely magnificent. If you spend time looking at the uh, different windows with uh, little brochures that give you the themes of the different windows, and then you have lunch, it's a very nice, you can do it in, in uh, let's say, six hours or seven hours. Uh -huh. I mean, I think you... Some people would probably go and then come back and just say, I've been there, and they'd be there for two hours or something like that. But you don't need more than a day. You don't. Okay. Uh, but but it's a lovely, lovely side trip out of Paris to take. And that's especially nice for people who've been to France a few times, been to Paris a few times, you know, maybe try something different. Try something different. Yeah. And it's really, it's really super. Yeah, this is the third place we've suggested a, as a day trip from Paris. Um, the first was... Uh, France. Reims, and then we talked about Versailles, Versailles. which also kind of takes a while. Oh, I mean, the, you know, it's closer. C Versailles is closer, but I would say Versailles, you do need a day. Yeah, because there's more because to of the park. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, that is, if you you can go and you can go and just shuttle through the 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 uh, chateau and be pushed through, more likely, <laughs> uh, and then come out and then just leave and get back on a train and go back to the center of Paris. And you can do that in a half a day if you want. But if you want to really appreciate Versailles, the gardens, you, you have to go to the park, you have to see the Petit Trianon and all of those things that are the other structures that are further out in mm -hmm, the park. Mm -hmm. So in terms so, of just being there, I would say that Versailles is certainly a place where you can stay from 10 in the morning till 4 or 5 in the afternoon with mm -hmm. no problem whatsoever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Chartres, if you go and get there at 10, 
you can visit the cathedral, have a lunch, walk around the town, and probably by three you're ready to leave. Okay. You know, I mean, but still, these are lovely side trips to do. Yeah, yeah. And they're unforgettable. Yeah. You know what I would love is, I would, I would love to be able to see the construction and just the buzz that must have been around that place. Well, you know, to in do it so fast because thirty years is really thirty years is fast. absolutely remarkable. I don't yeah. think even the Canterbury Cathedral was built in uh, that short a time. Uh, mm-hmm. But but w- in the summertime, many of these places, and I'm not sure about Chartres, but I know that many of them have what they call the sound and light shows. Ah, and uh, they do that. And they give you an idea of how they were built. Mm-hmm. The only problem with them is that they're always in French. Well, that's not a problem for me. It's not a problem for you. <laughs> or for you. It may be a problem for some of our Learn listeners. Learn French, folks. Learn what you do is French. you get to see the images or you get to see the lights, but you don't necessarily get to hear the translation. Yeah. But they do have things like that. Well, this is the thing about France is that uh, official events are usually, I mean, they're held in French and occasionally you'll get a translation, but for the most part, no. No. Just just like in uh, in Le Louvre, we mentioned that there are lovely uh, workshops, ateliers in right. French that you can do, but as far as I know, they're all in French. They're all in French. You know, and there's some for little kids that are absolutely amazing. Um, you get guided tours in every language, but you cannot... Yeah, the guided tours, but the, but the workshops... The workshops, no. You know, they're no. in French. I they're mean, French. that's just the language of the country. So that's incentive for you to go and learn the language. And, and you can do that with uh, uh, Lawless French. or fr- Yeah, I think that's it's lawlessfrench.com. It's my French Laura mm-hmm. um, who's teaching French. She, she'll, she'll hook you up. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Elise. You have uh, inspired me to go... I don't think I can possibly go this year. We'll see if I can go this year. Oh, we'll try. Chartres sounds really fun to it me. It sounds, it is, I, it is. It I really think is I nice. could spend the whole day in the church just looking at the art. Oh, and I think the, you could. Yeah. Especially since you love sculpture so much and you love taking pictures. I think mm-hmm. you would have a wonderful time. But go on a Friday so you can do the labyrinth. Oh, that's true. That's, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you much. Listeners, don't forget, we would love for you to subscribe to our website. So look for the green button. The green button. Right now, it's on the left-hand side. Who knows? I might redesign the site and put it somewhere else. But I will try to keep the green button top left-hand corner of the site. Because uh, So on the left, you subscribe to the website. On the right, you subscribe to the podcast. See? I've got it. I've got my priorities. She's got her priorities. Thank you much. We'll talk to you next week. See you again soon. Au revoir. Bye.